Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's online forum that is hosted by the South Africa African chapter, more specifically the Cape Town region. For those that don't know me, my name is Robin Williams. I'm a regional director at the South Africa African chapter, and I'll be your program director for today. In terms of the agenda, we have two speakers that will be sharing some of the insights and the topics of cybersecurity scenario planning and also uh, emerging technologies within the field of internal audit. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker's name is uh, Fani Boita. Um, Fani is the Chief Operations Officer at Fertech. Um, and Fertech stands for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Technologies. So Fani is a curious uh, technopreneur, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and a yes. revolution evangelist uh, with an MSc in engineering and experience in corporate finance. Fani is interested in what the future holds for finance uh, professionals. Currently, Fani holds the position of COO at Fertech and is also involved in shaping the future workplace of finance professionals to the work that him and his team at Fertech are performing using emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, process automation, and various other fourth industrial um, uh, revolution technologies. So finally, welcome and uh, welcome um, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Robin. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to uh, everyone in the audience. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. So as Robin introduced today, we are going to be speaking about the evolving role of internal audit in light of some emerging technologies. And I just want to obviously start with a disclaimer. So this talk does not aim to be an endorsement or indictment in terms of any of these technologies and their use uh, within the internal audit or any other industry but it's simply a narrated view of the reality that we're seeing out there. The showcase of technologies was taken out of uh, some of our Fertech IP, as well as uh, publicly available sources from uh, other sources of IP, such as our technology partners, uh, UiPath and, and some others. So I think let's just start maybe uh, with some thought provoking things around AI and technology. Uh, the meme that's on the screen at the moment was taken from uh, one of my favorite films, uh, which is Terminator 2. And in that film, there is a artificial intelligence uh, singularity that gains consciousness that becomes self-aware as it will. Now, I'm not going to spoil the, the film for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, but the joke in this meme is that uh, after becoming self-aware, this artificial intelligence discovers uh, the, the art of arguing on internet forums, and as such, the human race is saved because it's fully occupied by that. Now, this is a joke, but it begs the question whether AI has got a place in society yet. And when we say society, it means, do we actively invite artificial intelligence into our lives? As it turns out, it does, we do. Uh, if you look around you uh, at some smart speaker that might be on your desk, in your living room, in your bedroom, uh, the, the smartphone that you no doubt have in your hand right now, scrolling Instagram if you're a bit bored with this talk already, all of these things are different forms of artificial intelligence. Have you ever wondered how Spotify comes up with that uh, brilliant Britney Spears uh, playlist for you uh, day after day, just sensing your mood and, and getting the notes right? Have you ever wondered how Siri uh, comes up with such great answers to things which is actually human speech as opposed to direct voice commands to a computer? The reality is that behind all of these things, there are very powerful AI engines and on an ongoing basis, and increasingly so, we invite these things into our lives. The question though becomes, where would you draw the line? So recently, there was a interesting article that was published about a robot lawyer service. So essentially, this is a conversational AI. 
uh, that can help you with legal questions, legal advice, etc. And the question in the article then becomes, would you be comfortable for a robotic lawyer to defend you? I think keep in mind that when you go into a legal battle, you should only have one desirable outcome and that's to win. Uh, and that should be as long as everything happens in a legal manner to win at all costs. Now, if you consider something like artificial intelligence lawyer, this lawyer could have studied the entire internet and remembering perfectly every single previous precedent and law uh, outcome uh, court case that happened in the specific matter that you're trying to battle. It can also understand exactly who you're up against in terms of your human opponent and understand their history of arguing in court and focus their strategy around what's uh, maybe the weak points of the other party. I think this begs an interesting kind of scenario and dilemma for us of where we would draw the line. And I think this change can often be quite scary um, when it comes around. And we could think that it's great if it's far enough removed from me, like the device on my phone. But the moment that it starts coming into my industry, it seems to be a threat, a direct threat to my livelihood, my job, and, and my future. There's this great Chinese proverb that says, when the winds of change blow, some people build walls and other people build windmills, which I think is a great illustration that we can find opportunity in, in light of any kind of challenge, uh, changing environment, or any new scenario that presents itself. I'll take the example of when the first uh, automatic teller machines or ATMs were deployed in South Africa. Shockingly, that was uh, 40 years ago already. Now, at the time when you had the need to withdraw uh, cash from your bank account, you would go to your bank branch and you would access a teller. And I mean, we don't think about it anymore, speaking about a bank teller, but that's exactly what they did. They would sit behind a desk and they would count out money that is in your bank account and hand it to you across the desk. So with the advent of the automatic teller machine, this surely should have been a very, very frightening scenario for these uh, people in the bank branch, who I would think made up the majority of staff in the bank branch um, to, to their livelihoods and their futures. Now, the need arose out of uh, people saying that uh, it's, it's a bit restrictive to only have access to my money uh, during office hours and banking hours can sometimes be even shorter than office hours. And it was a requirement that was not even stated at the time to increase customer service through these channels. So these days you can do uh, deposits, you can do a range of other services, sometimes even opening new products, opening new bank accounts through these uh, ATM channels. But in reality, if we think about what the ATM did for the livelihood of those people who used to be tellers in a bank branch is, number one, banks don't employ less people than they did 40 years ago. They employ a lot more people. Number two, the typical person working in a branch, I would argue, has got a more fulfilling job because they truly deal with customer service. They truly deal with more complicated tasks than just opening a lockbox or a vault, counting out a certain amount of money and handing it to a customer. Having said that, there is no AI in internal audit or IA, right? And I think we should maybe take that statement and go and think again about it. So by the way, uh, if we try to learn about uh, IA or internal audit for all of the internal auditors out there, uh, and a simple search on the internet would bring up uh, this specific uh, process flow diagram, which is horrible, not only in resolution, but also in terms of its makeup. This, by the way, is your ISO 9001 definition of what the internal audit process should look like. So. If you've never seen it, uh, go and visit the internet or any ISO manual. But uh, honestly speaking, let's find something that is a bit more 
uh, understandable and I think a bit more relevant. So you can go and find multiple different versions of this internal audit uh, process flow breakdown. And what you'd see with all of them is that it centers around the basic tenets of planning, execution, reporting, and monitoring. Now, if you look at the different ones, there's various different sub steps or different sub processes that flow into these different process legs, but they center around the same kind of themes in terms of planning, uh, using audit plans, risk assessments, understanding the scope, and then flowing into the execution where we like to apply audit techniques. That's only after a lot of data gathering and massaging uh, has happened, compiling working papers, and in the reporting stage, uh, you know, expanding those work papers into different kinds of reports and findings and recommendations. And then in the monitoring phase, uh, providing insights, providing, uh, providing guidelines for the business going forward in terms of uh, if effectiveness of internal controls, additional internal controls or processes that need to be followed, uh, segregation of duties, et cetera. So what this diagram does not adequately represent in my view is the concentration of effort within these sub-steps or sub-processes. Now let's imagine an internal auditor as being a single person. And I know that on large uh, internal audit accounts in large organizations, this could be multiple departments, teams of people at various different levels. But I think it's helpful to imagine this as a single person and think about how they spend their time when conducting internal audit. You know, sometimes they need to be an engagement manager going and speaking to business and understanding the context of the specific department, the specific business process, how it's evolved to what it is. This is clearly kind of a project driven environment. So there's an element of uh, playing project manager as well. Just skipping the middle part, uh, at the end, they become some kind of a report compiler and actually applying their audit skills is arguably not the lion's share of what they do. And if you start to break it down to this middle block, roughly 80% of their time spent, you don't really need to be an auditor for. And in fact, if you go and extrapolate this thought with our context around technology this afternoon, the question becomes, do you even need to be a human for this? Now, I mean, this picture is surely ridiculous because this guy's absolutely drowning in paper. And our environments are now devoid of paper, or at least uh, starting to get devoid of paper. So shouldn't technology that's replacing this paper then be automating and driving this process? Well, let's look at some of the technology that we employ in this space. So in the first place, there's our good old trusty friend, Excel. We use it for, for everything from remembering birthdays, setting up our home budget, to signing off on seriously large audits. You know, we joke in the industry that Excel is one of the best ERP systems even around to this day. Speaking of which, we spend a lot of money implementing large, complex, and very involved ERP systems. And at the end of the day, we should ask ourselves are these things? really automating and driving and streamlining our financial and audit processes or are they just a really big digital storeroom for documents and really driving up the headcount in terms of how many people need to complete a, a multi-tenanted process like a three-way match without real automation coming from the system. So speaking about purely kind of audit processes, we've got systems and applications that can support that process and that can help us to some extent with some of the analytics, creating working papers, but not really automating much of that effort that we saw on the previous screen. And the question then becomes, none of these systems really does anything automatically. And why is that? So I postulate that the problem here is that the current technology that we viewed underpins some parts of the audit, but it doesn't drive it. The challenge is not unique to audit. It's persistent across finance, across supply chain, many other parts of the business. 
And we don't think that this is due to a shortage of the technology existing, but maybe a shortage or a old school thinking that still prevails. If we had to kind of uh, see what this old school thinking looks like, technology is pervasive in the organization, but when we speak about an invoice or any kind of document capturing, we see the role of technology as being the system of record onto which that information is captured and the role of the human being the mechanism by which that information is extracted from a document and captured onto a system. Again, with internal controls, you know, the systems can provide some limited support in terms of internal controls, like calculating the VAT, again, when we're capturing these invoices. But really, uh, we still see the humans as the first line of defense, and we trust them and test them to be the person that implements the internal controls. In terms of reconciliations, you know, in South Africa, we're quite interesting in that we pay on statement as opposed to on invoice. And for that reason, statement recons is very important across all of our functions. But again, yeah, I visited quite a few businesses in the last while where the statement recon or any recon for that matter happens completely wide of the ERP or accounting system with humans often in Excel and on paper performing that recon and feeding some one line digital feedback back into the system. Reporting analytics and insights, you know, that information exists to a large extent on the system of record. But again, we just see the system of record as being the database for that. Reports are still largely compiled by humans in Excel. And then the insights drawn from that, again, humans applying all of that effort. So how do we solve for this? Well, the first thing is, I believe we need to reset our expectations and our perception of technology's role in finance, accounting, and audit. You know, change can be scary, but it is inevitable. And if we embrace it, then we can realize opportunities out of that change. As a matter of fact, that change is happening the quickest within the ICT and finance industries. So I'm just flashing up a result from a very interesting study that was conducted last year. It was called the State of AI in South African Business. And I've highlighted these two industries where it's not important what the detail is around this, but these uh, dark blue areas where respondents answered yes shows that the highest uptake of AI exists within the ICT and finance slash insurance industries. If we think about the context that we're talking about now, technology and audit, technology and finance, these actually create an interesting overlap and almost merge into one industry. The question then becomes, how do we reset this view of our old school thinking to changing it to the finance of future? An example could be that an invoice or any kind of source document, the role of technology should change to becoming the actor that captures the document onto a system automatically without any intervention from a human. The role of the human should just be in cases where, for example, the scan quality is extremely poor, maybe 5% of cases to verify the extraction that was proposed by the AI, the robot, the machine that's doing this. In terms of internal controls, we should be automating these internal controls and the function that should be responsible for that should be the technology. You know, there's a, a portal that SARS has given us access to for free, for gratis. You don't even have to log into any kind of transacting platform where you can check the VAT registration of any of your uh, suppliers or customers. I imagine getting every invoice into your organization and running it through that uh, VAT registration portal first to check that the VAT registration number, the VAT registration status, et cetera, of the, the, the invoice you're attempting to pay is in fact correct. This reduces, it's not only reduces the effort that the humans need to expend, but it actually enhances the process. Recons, uh, checking functions, checking source documents, our expectation should be that the machine, that the robot, that the AI should be doing all of this and that humans should just be reviewing these reconciliation results. In terms of reports, analytics and insights, we should not only be happy with the technology being the custodian of that information, but the technology should be creating the reports and go one step further 
creating insights, trends, outliers, and other assistive information so that the humans can start with the insights. Imagine just the most senior person on an audit reading the reports from an insights perspective and then working backwards into the detail, but only where required. So the technologies that we use in this space to achieve these things are things like a robotic process automation. I've mentioned artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is one uh, key application area is in document understanding. And document understanding is principally different from what we would call OCR in that document understanding AI can understand what a document is, what its contents are, and what you're supposed to do with that document. Advanced analytics, which flows as a result out of applying these different technologies, applying other technologies like process mining, which we'll see a short introduction to in a while, and only bringing in the human into the loop when required. Essentially running finance and audit like a production line, as opposed to like a very human centric um, kind of physical assembly line that's, that's very human heavy. So the one technology that I mentioned there, some of you out there will be familiar with this concept. And uh, this is um, process, robotic process automation. Uh, mind you, it's not an actual little robot that gets deployed, uh, but it is software that can operate systems like your ERP systems, like your caseway systems and your Excels, exactly like a human would, but at great speed and applying business rules in real time and not getting tired, taking weekends or holidays, or even a rest in the evening. This short video, I'm not going to play the entire video, but just gives you a view of how robotic process automation goes to work, extracting information from invoices, and then opening a system. In this case, it is zero, uh, the zero finance and accounting system, and entering the values from that invoice into uh, the zero system, uh, along the way, pr providing some process analytics in the form of Excel, and finally providing process analytics and insights uh, in a Power BI dashboard. So let's just watch this video. So at this stage, we're going to run the robot, uh, but only have it displayed to a human for the simple purpose of uh, showing you this demo. So what you're seeing in front of you is the robot interpreting different values on an actual municipal invoice. Now, municipal invoices can be quite complex in their nature, their layout, et cetera. But because we're using document understanding, this robot understands that this is a municipal invoice. It understands from which municipality it is, for which specific property of this customer it belongs, as well as what the values on that invoice are. So now in the next step, we're going to run the same process, but more in the background. And I would like you to focus on the bottom left of the screen, where we're going to see the robot running at great speed through various different invoices. You'll see classifying document, extracting data, and there it's run through one of 77 invoices. The second one is going, the third one is going, and so forth, and so forth. So this is the speed at which this robot can go and look at the invoice, understand what the invoice is, as well as the contents of the invoice. And at this point in time, the robot's still storing this information in its memory. And now this is not an absolute requirement, but for this specific demo, we've gone and displayed this information in this uh, Excel spreadsheet. So you can see in a very short space of time, almost 100 invoices were correctly extracted, digitized, and laid out in this specific format. In the next step, the robot's going to access the zero accounting system. So again, this could be a Sage accounting system, it could be SAP, it could be whatever kind of finance uh, system uh, the, the specific organization uses. And we train the robot to open this system, go to the correct transaction or screen and capture these invoices into uh, the system. Now, uh, again, you can build in smarts along the way, such as uh, checking specific business rules, automating all of your internal controls, 
and especially uh, configuring it to uh, use the correct fat treatment on the different kind of properties, the different kind of uh, services that you might get from your municipality or any other service provider uh, for that matter. So in this step, the robot's just opening the system, going to the correct screen and starting to capture these header as well as line item details from the invoices that you saw it digitizing in the previous step. We'll see that the VAT treatment is specific to the type of property and the specific type of service that's been captured and that's all been configured as business rules into the robot. It also uploads the source documents to each of these posted transactions. So that again then makes the internal audit process a lot easier and we'll get to that point a bit later in the presentation. I think just skipping ahead to the last part of this video, uh, finally the robot presents, is able to present all of this information that went through the robot again in some enriched format like a uh, dashboard, uh, advanced insights or anything of this nature. And if you think about it, some of this information will exist in the ERP system, but not all of it. And what this gives us is a great enhanced view of what we call the process analytics or the process step analytics. So the reason why customers typically deploy these kind of technologies in the incoming side of their finance is because of these reasons stated here. But the thing that I want to focus on is the fact that you can enhance your processes and you can increase compliance. Now, when you're doing these kind of internal control automations on the incoming side of the finance, uh, by enhancing these processes, you can, for example, apply 100% of internal controls to 100% of your transaction base. You can increase compliance by capturing each and every step. So if you bring a human into the loop to verify a source document, you can capture exactly which human that was from which PC at which point in time and which values extracted by the robot this human changed to what other values, creating a perfectly clear audit trail of everything that happened in that process. So if we then take the typical internal audit uh, value chain or process chain, we can quite easily take these various different technologies and overlay them to the different steps or major uh, parts of this internal audit process that we need to undertake. By the way, you uh, issue these slides through the, the um, organizers of this meeting afterwards, and you'll have access to all of this material as a, as a great uh, Sunday evening reading material. Additionally, uh, all of the videos that I've shown uh, in this presentation, there will be uh, YouTube links for all of those. So you can go and watch and rewatch those at any point in time. And this is really a single view that we can spend a lot of time on to understand how process mining uh, can go into the engagement planning, um, how robotic process automation can uh, assist with the test design effectiveness and the operating effectiveness, and how all of these tools can come together in terms of the, the, the final bit of communicating the results and the insights, as well as then monitoring the outcome of this internal audit uh, going forward. But what you'll really see is that all of these technologies have got multitudes of use across these existing activities that get performed in the internal audit cycle. And what they do is, number one, they enhance the process. Number two, they greatly reduce the effort. And number three, they create a level of structure around this that really um, kind of gives it a, a level of repeatability so that you can really run internal audit like a factory. If we just zoom in on a few different applications of these technologies, so in the planning stage, uh, let's just understand how process mining can look at an entire organization that you might have never consulted with before and easily go and map the actual business processes as opposed to the theoretical processes that happen in that organization. And that could lead into your risk assessment. It could lead into planning your different um, activities 
uh, on the physical execution side of the internal audit. Robin, just let me know if the system audio doesn't come through on this one. It should though. Can you hear it? Process mining creates a view of your business process from all the existing data in your line of business applications, things like SAP and Salesforce. Here I am viewing an HR process that pays employee relocation costs. As you can see, on the surface, it looks like a very simple linear process with only a few steps. However, life is never that simple. And luckily, process mining gives me the ability to see all variations of this process that have occurred. We also understand which variations happen most frequently. To use a driving analogy, we are able to see the well-traveled freeway versus the roads less traveled. This insight helps me understand the best parts of a process to automate first to maximize my return. It even allows me to see the impacts of my changes as I deploy those automations by comparing processes over time. Okay, really just a very quick view of uh, process mining and, and you can go and, and read up a bit more about it, but it's a very powerful tool that can understand an organization's processes without a human having to go through standard operating procedures or even trawling through a system. Now, in terms of the project execution side, again, there's many different technologies, including process mining analytics, as well as robotic process automation that can be applied in that sense. But just to give you guys an idea of some of the power of this, um, we've got a specific situation of a balance sheet that uh, went out of balance uh, on a legacy finance and ERP system. And essentially what we did in this scenario is we trained a robot to trawl through the entire ledger and go and compare uh, transactions on, on both sides of the ledger to find where the potential source of the mismatch is. Now, you know, more modern finance systems could have certain smarts around this. Surprisingly, I've seen modern ones that can even go out of balance. But this is just to illustrate the kind of tenacity and veracity that you can use RPA for to not even go look through spreadsheets or physical lines of data, but to go into the system and look up transaction by transaction and matching it to different other transactions. Another very powerful use case for this in internal audit is using the reverse of the document understanding that I showed capturing the invoices previously. And in that case, going through each of the captured transactions on an ERP system, downloading the source documents and verifying that the values on the source documents are exactly uh, the same as the, as the values that are captured on the system of record. Now, just skipping a bit ahead in this video, uh, at some point in time, this uh, bot does find uh, the potential mismatch. So we went and injected the potential mismatch into this ledger. And after running for long enough, the bot finds the source of this mismatch. And then it can list it in any fashion that you want to. Um, so in this case, it could be a simple uh, Excel report, but it could also be corrected on the spot. It could be emailed. It could be workflowed. Uh, to the correct person. And so this is also useful both in terms of day-to-day -day finance, but then also finding the kind of mismatches uh, that, that could be existing within a uh, customer's ERP system, within your own ERP system. And so there, the robot has identified some of these potential mismatch transactions and they could be further investigated. But the, the key thing here is that the robot will gladly go through every single transaction in an entire ERP system, looking for source documents, looking for mismatches, et cetera. Something that we don't even feel fine to ask a clerk to do. In terms of the final step, so uh, the reporting and continuous monitoring, I've illustrated how we can automate internal controls. And I think then that the evolving role of the internal auditor becomes auditing the, the nature of these internal controls that have been aut automated checking that they were in fact online in an automated fashion for the entire year, as opposed to sampling and pulling a set of transactions to actually check whether those internal controls were applied. Because if you are automating internal controls and you are applying it to 100% of transactions, you 
actually be auditing the thing that was auditing those internal controls in the very first place, as opposed to the human, because that, that function has now been removed from them. In addition to that, because we're running all of these different process steps through a robot, it gives us a much deeper and more insightful level of analytics that we can start driving better insights back to business and we can increase our value as internal audit from not just being uh, the policeman and coming with findings and all of the rest, but giving them insights and advice about certain parts of their business process, how to run it more efficiently and how to do certain things in a slightly different way. If we then bring all of these concepts together, we can start looking at putting together a suite of products that could automate audit. And so in this sense, I want to show you guys this uh, product that we put together. It's called Automate. And let's watch the video. Okay, so I guess that brings us to the kind of reflection bit where we want to see how this guy on the left hand side can evolve into someone who is really only applying their audit skills for uh, most of the time, not having to massage data, collect data and all of the rest. Now, um, if we if we jump back to the previous uh, kind of slide that I showed in this regard, and we look at the percentages of, of where time is spent, and we imagine this still as a single person, we'll see that all of these elements of manual verification 
and manual checking and a lot of report compilation, all of these things have essentially been deleted out of our working day as an internal auditor. Yes, we're still going to have to do the human functions, but these things are fun. Being an engagement manager, project manager, and ultimately, if you don't have to do all of the drudge of bringing the data together, checking source documents, then there could be a, a much more fun element in terms of becoming a report interpret, interpreter and insights creator, looking at all of the data that, that gets thrown at you and pr providing insights to the business that you're servicing or auditing at that point in time. This means that you can push up that amount of time that you actually spend applying your hard-earned audit skills. It means that you can spend some time uh, proposing improvements like the automation of internal controls. And it also means that your role should change from auditing the people that's performing the process to auditing the technology and not the transaction itself. I think we can even find a bit of free time in this future scenario. So where does this leave us? So I think the first thing that's been clear through all of the examples of technology coming into a space where humans have worked, and I'm talking all the way back from when humans were the only ones that were plowing fields um, through to we, where we've got tractors now, uh, ATMs, uh, any kind of these technological, technological examples, is that in all cases, humans are not going away because of AI or the technology. In this case, neither are internal auditors going away. And by the way, I'm not uh, insinuating there that they're not humans. But I really think that there are more useful ways of applying humans in the process, as it was with the case of, of ATMs. You know, we spent the last 30 years getting rid of paper, I think, like kind of, in a lot of cases, we, we bring it back um, out of the electronic system by printing something and signing it, which is ridiculous. But I think, you know, the last three years were spent moving the processes that were purely paper-based onto IT systems. So I think the next few years we're going to see us getting rid of the manual effort that still exists in those systems. And that's both from an accounting as well as an audit perspective, including uh, other lines of business. But I think for this talk, it's very relevant within those two fields. So as I mentioned, auditors are not going away. But I do think the ones who are going to embrace this are the ones who are going to really reap the benefits out of this. If we go back to the ATM example, I'd imagine that when ATMs came around, the guys who said, you know what, these things are ultimately going to fail. No one's going to trust this electronic box sitting outside of the bank for money. I'm really going to hone my skill as a physical human teller. And you would have found another crowd that would have said, you know, this is a technology that's here to stay. And it's probably automating a part of my job that I don't particularly like. So let me invest time in understanding how to service customers. For example, if they've got questions about how to use this ATM, or if they've got different questions that I can help them with in terms of opening bank accounts or other queries, I think it's the, the latter group that really thrived uh, after the advent of those ATM machines. And then that will in, invariably, so the starting point here is, is internal audit, and we need to start pushing business to automate internal controls. And it, it feels almost counterintuitive that it needs to be driven from this seat and this perspective. But over time, this will mean that the scope of internal audit will change from auditing transactions to auditing the systems that are enforcing those automated internal controls. And also, I, I believe that it will change from becoming the people who sample transactions who verify source documents, who monitor whether internal control was applied to becoming the advisors that help business in terms of improving the robustness of their process, improving the way that they conduct business, and ultimately doing stuff that's more fun than just going to find source documents and verifying values uh, against a, a system of record. 
So thank you very much. Uh, that was my talk uh, for today. And uh, I want to open for questions and discussion now. Thanks, thanks, Fanny. Um, so, so there's a couple of questions that's come through on the chat and I'll read them to you and direct them to you. Um, also just a, a few comments as well. So I'm just going to start off with the first one and I'm not too sure how familiar you are with the, you know, this product, um, Bitvest Alice. So Boitemelo asks, is um, Bitvest Alice, um, you know, which is a data analytics tool that was developed by the Bitvest Internal Audit Team, is that artificial intelligence? So I don't know if you can weigh in on that question. Uh, yes, so I am uh, quite well familiar with the Bitvest Alice product, as well as the team that sit behind the Bitvest Alice product. Um, I'm not at liberty to say too much about what's under the bonnet there, but I do think that uh, with the Bitvest Alice product, um, there is a lot of uh, good things coming in the way of applying um, audit principles within that product set. I do think that if we look at products like Alice going forward, uh, a thing that's going to become a major driver in this space is something that has to fetch the data out of the source systems and truly apply uh, document understanding. Of course, in the, in the, in the case of uh, Bitvest Alice, which is in um, the Bitvest group, um, that's, that's obviously a place where you can find uh, kind of similar business processes uh, in, in, in different, uh, similar finance processes in different parts of the business. Um, and, and I think it's great if large organizations go on drives like this, where they um, essentially want to promote their internal audit programs through systems, et cetera. But I do think still that uh, there's a space for um, kind of the multiverse out there of, of heterogeneous uh, organizations running different systems with very, very different finance processes uh, where the internal audit principles stay the same, but the, the fetching of source documents might be different ball games uh, depending on where you go. Oh, sorry, so I was on mute there. So yeah, the next question is uh, from Dumasani. Um, so he's asking when can it be referred to as artificial intelligence? And then when can it be referred to as machine learning or robotics process automation? So what, what's really the difference between those different technologies? Okay, that's, um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a question that we have to discuss over many beers. But um, <laughs> let me give you the short version. So robotic process automation describes the way that the technology interacts with our systems. And robotic process automation uh, means that it can open your ERP system or your timesheet system or any of those systems through a human user interface. So, so the GUI as we refer it. But that doesn't, that doesn't specify whether that robotic process automation has a level of artificial intelligence built into it or not. Um, robotic process automation goes back as much as 10 years when it was very simple scripting. And to an extent, if you think about macros in uh, Excel, that is almost edging on very primitive robotic process automation. So then uh, around AI and ML, so machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence simply means it is somewhere where you put in uh, a set of information into a specific group of uh, programming um, structures. So a very typical one is called a neural network. And these programming structures took the data and they enhanced themselves. They essentially built on top of uh, all of the code that the humans put into that programming by learning from uh, some of the data within this data set that you gave it. And um, all, mach all machine learnings are on artificial intelligence, but not all artificial intelligences uh, have a component of machine learning. So the machine learning side means that 
this is a type of artificial intelligence which takes in more and more data over time and essentially becomes smarter either by virtue of its own actions or by checking um, some other thing which could be a person doing it. And so in this case, when we said that the 5% of uh, really um, poor quality source documents uh, will be verified by a human, each time that a human looks at what the robots predicted and either confirms that to be correct or incorrect, that feeds back into the machine learning module and that makes this machine smarter and smarter and smarter over time. Every time that you click on one of those, you might also like products at the bottom of the take a lot screen. You are teaching that machine learning module that they were actually correct in proposing uh, that product to you. But like I said, that's a very, very short version of that answer. And I'm happy to, if you buy me beer, uh, entertain that discussion for longer. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks for the answer. I did answer the next question that was in the chat. Um, the next question is from Boyton Mello and asked, could adoption on artificial intelligence be dependent on how data-driven the industry or the organization is? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, there's that meme that's a joke. Uh, it's the multiple choice question. What really drove your company's digital strategy? And then the winning answer is always uh, COVID and work from home for the last two years. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, global events like that typically give us a step change in terms of how we deal with these things. Now, just using COVID and work from home as an example, suddenly all of the organizations where our jobs were predominantly on a computer, like in a finance department, in uh, software development, et cetera, all of them could essentially within a week move their staff home. Uh, they could organize Teams meetings. And, you know, a lot of them after two years could mostly still survive and work from home. If you are in the job of bricklaying or carpentry or those kind of things, a Teams meeting might be great for catching up with your colleagues, but it's not any good in the way of how you actually perform your skill or your craft. In the same way, the more knowledge-driven environments and the environments that are, live closer to technology are the ones that are seeing higher adoption rates of these things. Now, I don't think that that's an indication of where the ultimate proliferation of this is going to end. So I do think that all industries is eventually going to go um, this way, but we're seeing the highest concentration uh, within finance and also the technology sector. And I think manufacturing... Uh, specifically around uh, the, the, the more high value ones like pharmaceuticals and chemicals is, is sure to follow on that trail. Okay, thanks for that. Um, here's an interesting question. So um, in the case of a legal dispute from captured values um, and data analytics, can the robot be regarded as an employee or a company agent? And then what are some of the legalities that one must clear before using artificial intelligence or robotics process automation? Okay, yeah, that is um, very interesting. And so, by the way, go and read about the ethics of artificial intelligence. Um, there's a whole field of study that overlaps uh, both social sciences as well as technology, which tries to investigate and understand this. Uh, for example, taking that to the furthest example, um, if an artificial intelligence judge uh, in the U.S. sentences someone to death row, uh, you know, what is the implications and the outcome and the underlying philosophy behind that? Now, in, in much simpler terms, if you're just talking in the office of finance, um, yes, a, a robot is in the one sense a user on an ERP system. And so in that way, um, you can, from an auditor's perspective, regard that as being a user that logged into a system. But from another perspective, it's just an assistive technology. So let's say, for example, that you took one invoice and you made a photocopy of that invoice. And it's the photocopy of the invoice that was uh, used as the document uh, throughout the organization. Now, in that instance, there was a dust spec um, that changed, for example, a zero to an eight. And that was a leading zero. And instead of, uh, you know, 
eight rand, uh, there's 800,000 rand implication on this. Now that photocopier again was an assistive technology and it should have been, um, there should have been other controls and other processes in place to kind of catch for that. Um, so again, in this case, a, a robot can't be malicious on its own. Uh, we always say a robot don't make any mistakes besides the ones that were programmed into it. And so the, the testing cycle through UAT and continuous monitoring needs to check that those bugs weren't designed into the thing. But then also uh, there needs to be kind of a retrospective process to check um, how the robot's performing. Just as a last thought, usually when we deploy this technology at customers, we set the threshold to absolute zero in the beginning, which means that everything that the robot does still gets flashed by a human, at least for the first two months. And that builds this confidence with the customer that the robot is doing stuff correctly. Then after that, you can set it down to an acceptable level where you get that effort reduction, uh, but you still get the benefit of the robot. And then we need to do sporadic checks or audits on the robot, robot to see that it is actually digitizing stuff correctly. But like I said, the most important part is still having the other processes designed around it to catch for uh, mistakes like that coming through. Okay, perfect. Next question. So for continuous auditing purposes, is it possible to have an artificial intelligence tool that is compatible with all systems um, that an organization is using? So essentially, like, um, is it capable of just plug and play and being able to extract data without much setup required? Okay, that's certainly the holy grail. And that's what, what we're aiming towards. So um, I think it's, it's reasonable to catch for 80% of all of the major systems that get used in business. But there's no doubt going to be some kind of homegrown or custom system that we'll come across uh, that we've never seen that it absolutely just won't work on. And the logic to apply there is the same as if you bring a human into that environment. You can teach that human quite quickly to work on that system, uh, but without a human ever seeing that homegrown or custom system, they won't know a uh, way to go and navigate to the correct transactions or find source documents, etc. And in that sense, we try to cover for the most use cases and then train where it's required. The last important thing here is that with robots, you don't program, so you don't have to code tedious lines of code but you actually train them on, on the steps to follow exactly like you would train a clerk or a human um, working in your business. And then the last point on which uh, I think you started touching is that it works cross system. So a lot of these other systems, if there's an internal control built into your ERP system, it can't jump over to your payroll system if that's a different system and cross check stuff between the two. A robot can, and that's a large part of the powerful um, nature of using this as a technology uh, for auditing. Okay, perfect. And then the last question that we have in the chat, is it possible um, for robotics processes um, automation systems to conduct IT audits? Absolutely. So, so we are, it's, it's one of the richest areas of where you can deploy robotic process automation. And it's one of the areas where we feel um, the adoption should have been a lot quicker than it actually is. And our argument behind that is that those are technology people in that environment to start with. So it should not be difficult to go and have a conversation with the system owner or with the CIO to say, look, we can use this technology to perform the IT audit already in your space. But there is a multitude of different use cases within IT audit, anything from checking um, changes in, in user permissions, um, checking for kind of uh, the, the learn algorithm that checks the, the, the number or the letter distance between usernames, for example. So to check for duplicate or spoofing usernames, um, to check anything uh, in terms of payroll from ghost employees to uh, payroll modifications, um, jumps in bonuses, uh, any kind of non-conformances that might be somewhere in between the IT audit and the financial audit space. So robotics is an absolutely valuable and powerful tool in that space. And I really hope that adoption would pick up there. Barney, thank you so much uh, for answering that question.
And also thank you for your presentation and your insights on the emerging technologies and how it impacts the internal audit process and activities. You know, we've always said it that the fourth industrial revolution is here and is impacting the way that we work and is impacting the way that we audit. And you know, the fourth industrial revolution is not only disrupting the world and businesses, but also internal audit. I think it's very important that as professionals within the audit profession to exploit this opportunity and technology and, and allow it to drive efficiencies within the process and allow it to, to drive a different way of auditing the audit process. Um, we're also seeing very good business cases for RPA with the internal audit. We're starting to see good use cases for machine learning and especially OCR. We were able to automate the auditing of manual controls and especially importing data from paper-based records. So finally, thank you so much again um, for your presentation. Really appreciate it. And then thank you again to our speakers. Uh